In the 1890s, there was a church in Mayfield, Kentucky, where two deacons were always fighting. Imagine that, two deacons uh, fighting in, in this uh, church. And it came to a head, interestingly enough, over a peg, just a, a peg that was placed at the back of the church. Remember, it's 1890, so the pastor could hang up his coat. And one deacon put it up and the other deacons like, how in the world could you put this up without asking uh, me first? And it ended up leading to a division where people in the church were taking sides and two churches started and the names of the churches were Peg Baptist and Anna Peg Baptist. <laughs> Sounds like a joke, but apparently it was a true story and the community still knows those churches uh, by those names. I noticed up in here at Rocky Mountain Calvary, there's a little bit of division going on between the Broncos and the Raiders. <laughs> so if you notice, Donnie, our facilities director and greeter here at this door, pretty bold with his Raiders jacket. So he asked me if I'd wear it in the pulpit. And I said, it'd probably be my last Sunday if I were to do that. <laughs> so we can overcome division. Amen. Like we can walk in unity in Christ Jesus this is an internal threat that is facing the church. We've seen the last couple weeks where the church is being persecuted. God gives them strength to stand against persecution. But now there's a division that comes from within the church. They're tested and they have to overcome a division. The division is over the feeding of the widows, especially the Hellenistic widows were not getting served. In verse 1, now in those days when the number of disciples was multiplying. Up until this point, what we've seen in the book of Acts is addition. God is adding to the church, but now the church is growing at such a rapid pace that it's multiplying. All you mathematicians know multiplication is much more than addition. 12 plus 12 compared to 12 times 12, and God is multiplying to the church. What's happening is God is reaching individuals and they're going out and sharing and investing. Disciples are making other disciples and the result is multiplication. We had the privilege of doing a memorial service on Thursday for a man in our church, Jack Welsh, and he's come to our church for over uh, 20 years. He's 96 years old, went home to be with the Lord. He was a physician, uh, also a pastor, a retired pastor, but he loved to mentor and he loved to invest in others' lives. So when I first started senior pastoring here at RMC, I was 27 years old and Jack made a point to start investing in, in my life. And he would come here to the church and pick me up. And he's the only person that I've ever met that would drive a vehicle with an automatic transmission with two feet. So he's got one foot on the brake and another foot on the gas. It was very jerky. It was always like, praise the Lord, we made it to Chipotle. <laughs> but every time that I met with him, I felt encouraged and challenged. And that's hard to do, to be able to challenge someone, but for them to also feel encouraged. But at his memorial on Thursday, it was shared that it was his prayer that in his lifetime, that God would use him to reach 10 men. He wanted to reach 10 men that would be faithful to the end. To the end of their lives, they would be faithful to the Lord and that those 10 men would go reach another 10 men. Pretty smart prayer if you think about it. And he was asked why 10 men because he believed in this concept of multiplication. So if 10 men reach 10 men that reach 10 men that reach 10 men over a course of a lifetime, the kingdom of God multiplies that investment that's taken place in one life at a time. There arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in daily distribution. The Hellenists are Jews, but they're Greek in their culture to the point where they would speak Greek. They wouldn't speak Hebrew. So there's a natural division between the Jews who speak Hebrew and then the Jews that speak Greek and their primary cultural influence is Greek. And so that, that division would be taking place prior. They would bring those differences into the kingdom of God. And these are all believers and the widows are being cared for, which is what the church should do. This is God's heart to care for widows. Pure religion, 
undefiled before God is to visit widows and orphans in their suffering, to keep yourself unspotted from from the world. And so the church is doing what is God's heart to care for, for their widows. Several years ago, Pastor Sean here at the church had a heart to start serving our widows uh, at RMC. And it's been really a blessing to our church to really know our widows and love and care for them. And if you're a widow, we'd love to have you to be part of, of that, that group. But as this caring and loving was taking place, the Hellenists were feeling like they were getting neglected, that they were not receiving food while the Hebrew-speaking Jews were receiving food, so they bring this complaint forward. And it may have been intentional. There may have been those that are, had this prejudice towards these Hellenistic Jews. It may have been unintentional, but it was, was happening. And this is the cause for division. If the church doesn't deal with this, this is going to lead to division. In Proverbs 17, verse 14, it says, The beginning of strife is like releasing of water. Therefore, stop contention before a quarrel starts. Think of it this way in your house. When there is releasing of water, whether it's flooding or a leak, a lot of flooding earlier on uh, this summer, you want to stop it as soon as possible. If a pipe breaks in your home, you're praying and hoping that someone's home to turn off the water all four of our kids, I make sure that they know where the main shutoff is to the water in the house. Because if you're home by yourself and a pipe breaks, you got to know where to turn the water off. And a fight is the same way. Strife is the same way. When there starts to be contention, when there's a complaint, we want to rush towards that to see God bring unity if possible. In Ephesians 5, we're challenged to fight for unity, to endeavor to keep the unity. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, besiege you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And this is why, this is what we have in common. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your baptism, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's above all and through all and in you all. That's a lot that we share in common. We all are in Christ. We have one faith, one baptism, one spirit. So endeavor to keep that unity. Jesus prayed in John 17 that we would be one as he and the Father are one. That's a tremendous amount of unity. So the world can look on and see that we're his disciples. There's times where we do everything possible to live inside of unity, and it takes two people coming together in order for there to be unity. And that's where Romans 12 comes in, where it says, as much as depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. Can we each answer that before the Lord? As much as depends on me, I've done what God would have me to do to try to pursue unity in the midst of this. Verse 2, then the 12 summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, so we see the leadership from the 12 apostles. It's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. I don't think that this is because the apostles think that they're above this. It's not that the apostles are like, we don't want to serve the widows. I think the apostles were, were servants. They were more than happy to do this. They saw this example in the life of Christ. But they understand that God had called them to this ministry of the word. And the priority of their time was to be devoted to prayer and to the word. And that this was a body. That the church was a body of many different gifts and functions. And so who would God raise up to be able to meet this need? If the apostles just jump in and meet the need, then the body doesn't function the way that it's intended to. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. I I like this word, seek out. This is intentional. And the multitude, which is fairly large now, we've seen thousands uh, get saved. The church being a part of this, seek out from among you seven men. Hey, are, are there seven names of seven men that would be faithful to serve the widows. 
a multiplication of leaders, a delegation that takes place. Who are they to look for? Do they have a good reputation? Are they full of the spirit and wisdom? So outside of the church and inside of the church, do they have a good reputation? Not that they're perfect, but they have a reputation of walking in integrity, full of the spirit of God. God didn't want the widows to be taken care of apart from the power of the spirit. Do these men have God's spirit inside of them? The fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, and kindness. And do they have wisdom, which is knowledge applied? Are they able to take knowledge and apply this? What stands out to me is how serious the early church is taking this. There's not this nonchalant attitude, well, it's just serving food. Let's just get some warm bodies. Anybody that's willing to do this, that will suffice. They're like, no, these widows are important to God. We want it to be overseen. We want it to be done well. And so let's look for some men that have a good reputation, that are full of the spirit, that are to walk in wisdom. It also reminds me of a crossroads that Moses was facing. He gets a visit from his father-in-law, Jethro. And Jethro's watching Moses, and apparently all of the people would come to bring their case before Moses, and Moses would decide on all of these disagreements. And people were waiting for a long time, and Jethro says, what you're doing is not good. You're going to burn yourself out, and you're going to burn out the people of God. You need more leaders. Just like here in Acts chapter 6, and the requirements that Jethro suggested to Moses is you need to find men that fear God, men of truth, and men that hate covetousness. Isn't that a good litmus test? Do they they fear God? Are they committed to the truth? Do they hate covetousness? Then raise them up, and some will be able to oversee thousands, some hundreds, some fifties, some tens. So of these leaders, There will be those that have different capacities and some can handle larger groups of leadership. Some can handle smaller groups of of leadership, but it was time for Moses to multiply leaders. In verse four, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The disciples understand they've got to stay focused on their calling and what God had called the apostles to was to spend time in prayer, praying for the church, praying for the lost, praying for God's guidance, wanting God's will, God's agenda, and also the ministry of the word, the work of laboring in the word and sharing God's word with people. And this is important. You know, I I appreciate the opportunity that I have here at RMC. It's a real privilege to dedicate time each week to to prayer and spending time in the Word and and preparing for teaching uh, God's Word. I'm thankful that we're a body here at RMC. I'm thankful for our pastoral team. Pastor Robert's a huge blessing uh, to me. He really oversees the day-to-day uh, of the church and the staff and the church finances. If, if you haven't met him, I would love for you to have the opportunity uh, to, to meet him and really has the, the gift of administration. But our whole uh, pastoral team, or our staff, all of you that volunteer, this is a body. And this is a body in the, the book of Acts. And as we seek to serve in the capacity that God called us to, then the the Lord is is glorified. But I'd also appreciate prayer in this because life is busy and ministry is busy and there's a lot of things that come up in the day-to-day of our church. And sometimes I have to say no to this over here to be able to say yes to prayer and and the the word of God. And sometimes it can be a bit of a juggling act, but I know that this is a, a priority that I can't let go in my life of trying to dedicate myself to prayer and and to the word of God. Ian Bounds puts it this way, what the church needs today is not more machinery, not new organizations or more and novel methods, but men whom the Holy Spirit can use, men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. The Holy Ghost doesn't flow through methods, but through men. He doesn't come on machinery, but on men. He doesn't anoint plans, but men, men of prayer. In verse 5, 
and the saying pleased the whole multitude. We see the Spirit of God working this way in the book of Acts. When God gives an answer, it's pleasing to the whole multitude. They're like, yeah, this, this makes sense. The apostles should continue steadfastly in prayer and in the word of God, and there should be a expanding of leadership. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. There's seven men, there's seven names that are listed here, and Stephen's the only one that gets a, a note. Luke, as he's writing this, is led by the Holy Spirit to put this note about Stephen, that Stephen was full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. What a compliment. We're all full of something, aren't we? <laughs> and sometimes it's not the best, right? But to be able to be full of faith, trusting God, and full of the Holy Spirit. What had gone on in Stephen's life where others could see that he was full of faith? Probably some trials, because trials reveal faith. Difficulties reveal faith. Had Stephen walked through some trials and walked through some difficulties that then showed that he was trusting in the Lord? These fruits of the Spirit were evident in his life that he was full of the Holy Spirit. And Philip is the next that's listed, and we're going to see more of Philip as we continue in the book of Acts. Also, we're going to see more of Stephen. Porchorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. What's interesting about these seven men is they all have Greek names, which most likely they were Hellenists. They were Jews with Greek culture, speaking Greek, it seems that they chose the seven men because the Hellenists were being neglected and it starts to alleviate the tension of this complaint. In verse six, whom they set before the apostles and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on him. Again, taking this seriously, this care of the widows, this distribution of food to the point where, okay, we want good reputation. We want full of the Holy Spirit. We want wisdom. And now they pray for them. And they pray for them before the, the church, before the multitude. These are the guys that are going to be responsible to make sure all of the widows are taken care of. In verse 7, the word of God spread. Isn't that beautiful? Here's this potential where there could be division. But instead of there being division, there's a multiplication of leaders all of the widows are being cared for. The apostles stay true to their calling, which was to be in the word and to, to be in prayer. And the word of God multiplies. God's people are healthy and they're going out and sharing the gospel and God's using that and people are getting reached. Not all conflict is bad. We need to remember that. I need to remember that. There's gonna be conflict in relationship with believers, but oftentimes it's in conflict that God causes growth. If we're willing, it's not comfortable, but pressing into what God has for us to receive growth in the midst of the challenge. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. So we saw in verse one, a multiplication was already happening. And now a second multiplication is happening. People are getting reached, they're getting discipled, and it's taking place. One of the things we note greatly in Jerusalem it seems that the message of Christ is primarily in Judea and Jerusalem. The church is not going outside of their comfort zone like Jesus had encouraged them. And it's actually persecution that's going to move them to some unreached areas. I love the end of verse 7. And a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. What? Priests? Obedient to the faith? These were the ones that persecuted Christ. These are the ones that are coming against the disciples, and yet now they've become obedient to the faith. This is an encouragement to us that no one is too far gone from God's reach. And a lot of times, those that are the most vocal against Christ are the ones that end up getting saved. And how awesome would these priests be at being believers with their background? They understand the Old Testament, they understand the Levitical system, the sacrificial system, used to having to kill animals for sin, then realizing that Jesus is the sacrifice for sin. 
talking amongst themselves, yeah, I thought it was a little strange when the veil of the temple tore in two. We now have open access to the throne room of God. This must have been powerful for these priests to be obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs amongst the people. So Stephen was faithful in what some would consider to be little things. He's caring for widows. And as he's serving and caring for widows, there's growth that takes place in his life. Now God is using him to do great wonders and signs. God's using these miracles to get the attention of unbelievers. Prior to this, it was the apostles that God was using in this way. Church, this brings us to a really important truth and growth happens in our lives through serving. There's really only a level that we can grow without serving. It's kind of going from the lecture to the lab. You could read online and watch videos on how to change the oil in your vehicle and you would learn. And you would definitely learn from an intellectual perspective and and honestly, it's not real hard from an intellectual perspective. It's like, okay, I get the few things that have to happen here. But you go change your own oil and you're gonna realize I understand this in a whole nother way. I've gone from the lecture to the lab. I have a working knowledge of this and there's a few tricks that go uh, to this and sometimes things don't go the way that they're, they're supposed to and all of those, those types of things, right? And we learn of God in the word and we learn of God in times like this but when we apply it to our lives and we begin to serve, there's growth that, that takes place. And if you're feeling led to serve here at RMC, I, I just want you to know, we would, we would love to have you serve here. This is your church. You're part of the body of Christ. And all of the things that you see taking place here are opportunities to be able to, to serve the Lord. Worship and, and the, the soundboard and greeters and ushers and the cafe and children's ministry and counseling and men and women's ministry, the list just goes, goes on and on. You can go to the church's website and fill out a volunteer application, but there's going to be growth that happens in your life as you serve. It may not be in one of those organized senses here at the church, but anytime that we begin to serve in our home, in our neighborhood, in our workplace, we start to encourage believers, reach out to unbelievers, I mean, is there a widow in your neighborhood that God wants you to start to serve? You, you know them. It, there's a need and you see a need and you begin to meet that need. We put other people's interests before our own and growth begins to take place in our lives. Maybe you've never experienced that or it's been a while since you've experienced that. Sometimes service can kind of start to go dormant in our lives. You know, we kind of back away from serving God and serving believers And we see in Stephen's life, man, there's just so much growth that happened as he served. Because read ahead for next week in chapter 7, Stephen just gives a really powerful sermon. An amazing sermon. He ultimately loses his life for the cause of Christ. He stands faithful to the end. He's the first martyr of the church. Where did it all begin for Stephen? Making sure some widows had food. And loving them and caring for them. Taking that step of faith. And then God grew him from that place. Here comes the opposition. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenes, Alexandrians, and those from Cecilia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. This is Africa, Tarsus, Turkey, a large geographical region comes against Stephen. Why against Stephen? Because God was using him to do these miracles. And from those miracles, Christ was glorified. The gospel was preached. So they come together against Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Did you catch that? You've got a large group from a large region coming against Stephen and they can't resist this wisdom and the spirit in which Stephen spoke. It wasn't that Stephen was smarter, or it wasn't that Stephen had this convincing personality, but he had the spirit of God inside of him. 
And God was giving him wisdom. It's the God factor. It's not by power or by might, but by my spirit, uh, says, says the Lord. They didn't know what to do with this man, Stephen. They, they couldn't resist him. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They're stirring up lies against Stephen, getting those to give a false report about Stephen. The way that they treat Stephen reminds me a lot of the way that Jesus was treated, some of the lies that were brought against Christ. If you've had a false accusation brought against you, it's not easy, is it? It's painful. You think about Stephen's life here. He loved the Lord, wanted to bless widows. God began to use his life with these great signs and and wonders. All of a sudden, there's this opposition coming against him. He's brought before the council. They're, They're accusing him of things that he never said. He never said anything against Moses or against God. He wasn't speaking blasphemous words. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. It seems that the people are easily stirred up. It doesn't take a whole lot for them to believe these lies about Stephen. I think it's where our culture's at right now. It just doesn't take a lot for people to get stirred into a frenzy, to respond in fear. So a group is rallied, and then they see Stephen, and they arrest him. They also set up false witnesses who said, this man doesn't cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place, the temple, and the law. Again, these false accusations, saying that Stephen is speaking against the law and this holy place. For we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. In verse 15, and all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him saw his face as the face of an angel. This is surprising. Here they are bringing this accusation against Stephen. Stephen's life is on the line. He's going to be stoned to death. But Stephen's just got this glow, saying his face is like the face of of an angel. How is it that Stephen's face is all lit up? We think back to the Old Testament with Moses. As Moses would spend time with God, be able to talk with God, and his face would glow. It was the mo-glow. And Moses was concerned about this glow fading, so he put a veil over his face. And Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it says, but we all with an unfailed face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of God, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3.18. We are transformed. We go from glory to greater glory as we behold the, the glory of God. The Christian life is not behavior modification. It's not self-help. It's us coming in contact with a good God. It's us beholding the glory of God, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And as we behold the glory of God, then we reflect the glory of God. We're like the moon. We don't have any glory. We don't have any light in and of ourselves, but we behold God's glory and we can reflect God's glory. And Stephen is reflecting God's glory here because he's worshiping God, because he's beholding God. Now, put yourself in Stephen's sandals and his shoes. It'd be easy for Stephen to be angry. He's being falsely accused. It'd be easy for Stephen to be afraid. His life is is on the line. He doesn't respond that way. He continues to keep his face steadfast upon the Lord. He's focused upon the glory of God. To the point then where Christ is seen. They're getting angry. They're getting upset. They're giving all these accusations on Stephen. And his face is showing the glory of God. In 2 Corinthians 4, 
Paul expounds on this a little more. He says, for we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is God who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. God has put power in these earthen vessels, in these clay pots. He's put the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He's put the gospel. He's put the Holy Spirit so that the power is not of us, but it is of God. Church, for us, whatever we behold, whatever we worship, that's what we're gonna reflect. And that's convicting, isn't it? Whatever my face is set towards, whatever has my attention is ultimately what I'm gonna reflect. And are we beholding the glory of God? Do we look at creation, not taking Pike's Peak for granted and going, God, you're awesome. You're, You're powerful. You're you're majestic. Thank you for creating these mountains, speaking the stars into existence. Are are we beholding the glory of God in the word? Taking time to sit at his feet in his word and and fighting for that time in God's word. Are we beholding God's glory in worship? Some powerful songs this morning to sing to the Lord and to think of the truth of those, those lyrics and we get to sing that Uh, to to the Lord. I think we can feel it in our hearts those days when we're set upon the glory of God. And as we're we're set upon the glory of God, we're not having to force it. God's just doing it. He's just reflecting his goodness in and through our lives. I want you to hear this. Stephen's okay. Actually, Stephen's in in a really good place. Yes, Stephen's going to be martyred. He's going to be stoned to death. And those stones are going to hurt. But he's okay. He's in a good spot. Do you know why? Because he's beholding the glory of God. And we can have people coming against us. We can be in a difficult circumstance. But if we're beholding God's glory, we're okay. Amen? Amen. We're in a good spot. Because we're seeing the glory of God. But we can have things going our way. No trials, no difficulties in a sense be in the easy street. And if we're not beholding the glory of God, we're not okay. We're not in a good place. We're not where we we could be. And it's really not about whether we're in a season of blessing or a season of difficulty. It's the attention of our hearts. If you're being blessed, man, behold the glory of God. Give glory to the giver of all good things. If you're going through challenge, behold the glory of God. Sometimes life is mundane somewhere in between. It's not amazingly awesome. It's not amazingly difficult. It just is. It's Monday morning. Behold the glory of God. And if we're beholding the glory of God, we're going to be in a good place. A few applications from our text this morning. And the first is, let's endeavor to keep the bond of unity. Is there just the beginning of strife that's taking place with another believer? Is there, there are this complaint that is rumbling. Just go to the Lord, go to prayer, go, go to wisdom and see if the Lord will bring about unity. This unity is inside of truth. It's not a compromising of truth. It's inside of the scripture, the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It's amazing they're not fighting over the essentials of how a person is saved, they're fighting over food, right? And a lot of times, our fights are not over the essentials of the faith. They're over something that could be solved. Would you agree that this problem is solvable? And we see the church doing that. And are there some conflicts that are happening in relationships? And if both parties can step back and seek the Holy Spirit and say, is this solvable? Is this an issue that we could come to an agreement and endeavor to keep the bond of peace? And then let's engage in serving. Say, man, is there a widow that needs to be served? Is there there a need that needs to be met? And God's putting on your heart a way to serve the body of Christ, to serve believers. Because when that happens, then the body's healthy. The body's functioning the way that the Lord intended. God's glorified And also there's growth that's happening and taking place in our lives. 
And then finally, the last application is behold the glory of God. Just, just enjoy the goodness of the Lord. Worship God for his grace and his forgiveness and, and his mercy and, and turn our face towards God's face. Oh, you're my shepherd. You're my father. You're good. You're kind. You're, you're coming again. I'm beholding your glory. This is our greatest goal. It's our greatest aim is to behold God's glory. And it's also our greatest good. It's, it's the best thing for us, for God to be glorified, for us to walk in that place of being worshipers. Would you stand with me and let's pray together. Father, we take a moment right now to put our attention towards you. There's none like you. There's none so gracious. There's none so kind. There's none so, so powerful. There's none that loves the way that you love. And we thank you that you sent your son to die for our sins, to, to pay the price that we couldn't pay. Also, we admit that we're distracted and we're busy and we're selfish and sinful and it's easy to go through a day without beholding your glory. So would you help us? Would you be gracious to reveal your glory to us in a greater way? Or would you help us all to realize that you have given us gifts, spiritual gifts? Show us those ways that you would want us to serve and protect us from division. Please, Lord, protect us from the evil one. If there's conflicts and complaints that need to be solved. Lord, would you help us in that for, for your glory? We thank you for the body of Christ as a whole. We ask that you would, would bless the body in Colorado Springs. Lord, as churches meet throughout this city, would you give us a love for you and a love for one another? In Jesus' name, amen.